we've said about Job is that there are two plots very skillfully woven together, one in heaven, one on earth. Both consist of debates. And I've already spoken about the heavenly debate between God and Satan. And the debate was whether there's anybody on earth who loves God for his own sake and not for the blessings he can get out of God. Now that's one plot and the key to the tension Every good drama has a tension. The key to the tension is that Job and his friends don't know about this wager in heaven and never do find out. Right at the end of the book, they're still not told about this wager between God and Satan over poor Job. He is the victim in a sense, the piggy in the middle between the two of them. And he never knows that. And that builds up tension in us because we want to tell Job why it's happening. And, uh, you know, if we'd been there and we knew this, we'd certainly tell him, but they didn't know this, so they had to try and find their own answer to the problem. Which brings us to the other plot, which is the debate that goes on on earth between Job and his friends. Why is he suffering so much worse than other people? They are sure Job must be sinning badly, secretly. But Job is quite sure he's not sinning secretly. And he protests his innocence. Now, we know who's right, but they didn't. And that builds up the tension when you know something that people in the actual drama don't know. So, in any particular case of suffering, none of us knows the whole picture. But he's asking these questions, the book of Job, isn't all religion materially based? And isn't all suffering morally based? Those are the questions. But the real question is not undeserved suffering. The real question is a question of faith. The real question is, can you go on believing in a good God when everything's going wrong? That's the real question. And that's a question that boils down to whether you trust God, whether you really believe in him. It's easy to believe in God when you're blessed and when things go right. But can you go on believing in a good God when things are terrible? That's the real question. You see, what was Job's greatest agony? What was his greatest pain? Well, he certainly had lots of physical pain, but that wasn't the real problem. Man can cope with physical pain. Was it social pain? Well, he was isolated. People just wouldn't talk to him. His friends walked by him. He sat on the ash heap at the end of the village street and people just walk the other side of the street rather than talk to him because people don't know how to talk to someone who's really suffering and really in pain and they, they don't know what to say so they avoid contact so he suffered social isolation was that his real pain he was even despised and typically the teenagers laughed at him and made a joke of him sitting on the ash heap Was that the real problem? No. Was it mental pain that he couldn't understand why it was happening? Was that the real pain? No. His real pain was spiritual because through it he lost touch with God. That was his real pain. And he cried out, Oh, that I knew where I might find him. If only I could talk to him. If only he'd talk to me. I'd argue with him. But I can't get through to him. Now that was the real pain and that was his deepest problem and it is often the deepest problem when you're going through a really bad time, you lose touch, you feel God's too far away, that he's no longer caring, that he's not talking to you, that he's not dealing with you and it is that pain which is the biggest challenge to faith, the pain of losing contact with God. Now in the prologue, We have four characters, five. We've got God, who is called Yahweh, the Jewish name for God, and he initiates the whole series of events by challenging Satan. Then we have Satan, and he's called here the Satan. And Satan actually means the accuser, so he is the accuser. Satan is not yet a proper name. It is a title the counsel for the prosecution, we would say, the Satan. And then we have Job, a good man, blameless and upright, who fears God and shuns evil. Now notice those two phrases. 
the fear of God makes you shun evil. The lack of the fear of God, you're not so worried about sin. If you fear God, you shun evil. And he did both. And God is proud of him and pleased with him. And yet he's also a man of property and children and health. But all those are going to be taken from him. Then we have Job's wife. Not sure how to talk about her without being chauvinistic. She's called a foolish woman. That doesn't mean uh, that she was lacking upstairs, but it means that she was insensitive. And she surely was. She tells him to commit suicide. She said, curse God and die. The man needs support and help, and here's his help meet being the very opposite. She was the first one to bring in pain. She was the first Job's comforter. And all she said was, you might as well curse him and die. He's not going to look after you. And you find a real gap here between, she doesn't say, I'll pray for you. I'll stand by him. She says, curse God and die. She's not going to identify with him. She isolates herself from Job. I feel from there. See, there's the first break in the relationships. God's your problem, she's saying. She's virtually saying, I don't believe in your God. That's pretty tough on a guy when his wife doesn't believe in his God. Then there are the three friends. Now, three of them are older men. It isn't until we get to Elihu that the young man comes in. They are three older men, but they vary in age. And in this dialogue, we have very interesting points put. The first thing the three friends do, and I wish it had been the only thing they did, was to come and sit with him and not open their mouths. Now that's probably the best thing you can do to someone who's suffering, not to discuss their suffering, just to sit alongside them. Everybody else was steering clear of him, but at least they came and sat with him. Unfortunately, Job opened his mouth. If he'd stayed silent, we might never have had the rest. <laughs> but uh, I think he just couldn't stand the silence. And he had to say something to them. And what he did was to curse the day he was born. He said, oh, if only I'd been stillborn. If only my mother had never conceived me. If only I'd been stillborn. If I'd even died in infancy, I'd never have known all this. I wish I was dead. But, of course, he wouldn't commit suicide because that's murder. And he wasn't free to take his own life. But uh, that's how he felt. He didn't curse God, but he cursed the day he was born. To curse your birthday. Cursed his conception. Cursed the fact that he wasn't stillborn. And then cursed the fact that he didn't die as a baby. And it was that that started the three friends into the debate. Now, Eliphaz, the first, was the oldest and the gentlest, the most sensitive. And that comes across. Now, each of these three spoke three times, so there's a kind of round debate. But I'm going to put all the three things that Eliphaz said together and Bildad and Zophar to get the feel of the people. All right? But it's not the way it's done in the dialogue. So in the three contributions he made, we have a picture of a, an elder, an elder statesman, a very pious, mystic man, and he solves the problem by denying it. He just says there isn't a problem. Orthodox doctrine is reward and punishment. And he says, I'm convinced by the evidence of history, by the cumulative wisdom of the ages, and above all, I had a special vision in the night. And they all said the same thing, that you are being punished because you sinned. So he even claims a vision here. Naughty. But he says it very gently. And he says, look, Job, human nature is inherently evil. Nobody can say they're innocent before God. Everybody sinned. We're all sinners. So why don't you just admit it? You see? Very gentle. He's saying, we've all sinned, I have, you have, that's why you're suffering, so admit it and God will get you out of it. So man, he says, brings trouble on himself and suffering and sorrow are part of life. 
So Job says, but why am I suffering more than others? And Eliphaz says, well, suffering is good discipline. It's God's way of making you a better person. Have you heard this kind of thing? And it's to be accepted in humility. And as soon as we accept the discipline in humility, we'll prosper again, we'll be healthy again. And there's a kind of gentle pleading tone. He says, just say you're sorry and all's well that ends well. Very nice, calm, gentle advice. But I'm afraid Job doesn't take it. So he gets a bit stronger. And he says, your insistence on innocence is in fact obstinacy. In fact, he accuses him then of irreverence and undermining religion. He resents his lack of response. And his sympathy gives way to sarcasm. Sarcasm is a dangerous thing. That gives way to scorn. And he repeats his belief in the depravity of human nature. And so he speaks about the total depravity of human nature. That's the explanation. We're all totally depraved, all of us, so you can't grumble about the suffering. And the wicked won't prosper, or if they do, they won't be happy. Now, you see how he rationalizes? He says, wicked can't prosper, but he said, if they do, they can't be happy with their riches. I'm sure of it. It's all forcing experience into doctrine. And we're not unfamiliar with that today either. And finally, when Job still doesn't respond, he takes as a last resort refuge in God's transcendence, says, God's too big to be concerned with you, Job. God's too far away to be involved in all this. Why are you trying to bring him into it? It really doesn't matter to God whether you live a good life or a bad life. Do you think you're that important? This transcendent God of ours, he can't be bothered with every individual life. Well, now that's the first comforter. And you can see how he gradually got stronger towards Job. But nevertheless remained fairly gentle. Then we have Bildad. The name means God's darling. Whoever called him that? Now, he is clearly a bit younger. He's in his 50s, I would put him. He's certainly younger. The eldest man spoke first. Of course, that's right in wisdom. You listen to the oldest first. That's a long tradition in wisdom. The oldest knows life better than the others. But then the next oldest, Bildad in his 50s, he's a theologian. He's a bit of an archaeologist as well. And he says, what's new can't be true. And uh, the traditional... He is the traditionalist par excellence. This is our tradition. This is what we've always believed. He's full of cliches, he's full of jargon, full of formula. Not so quiet, not so gentle. He's indignant, even angry. He's stung by Job's reply. And there's no trace of compassion in what he says to poor old Job. He's quite insensitive. He said, well, if you haven't sinned a lot, your children must have been sinners. For you to lose all your children, they must have been a pretty bad lot. <laughs> How to comfort a man in suffering, it's, it's really the humor of it. You don't know whether to laugh or weep. And he says, this is a moral universe, it's automatic. The law of cause and effect applies to our moral life as much as our material life. If you sin, you suffer. And you must be a pretty bad sinner. Can't see any other answer. And his relationship with Job became increasingly strained. Finally says about Job, must we listen to all this? That man has just run out of patience even. And he takes refuge in God's omnipotence. And he says, listen, you've forgotten God is all-powerful, so might is right, and whatever God does is right, because he's all-powerful. Now, this is an old argument that might is right. He finishes up by saying, look, God's bigger than we are, and you can't argue with him, so why don't you just accept it? So he takes refuge, as Eliphaz took refuge in God's transcendence, he takes refuge in God's omnipotence as the answer. And that, again, is not unknown today. And I will be speaking in this very room next week to some pastors who are teaching that and who believe it. But ultimately the answer is God is bigger than we are, so you can't argue with him. Well, that makes us puppets on a string, and predestination takes over. You see? 
Now the next man who comes in is younger but still middle-aged and he is the most dogmatic. It's interesting, the younger they get, the more dogmatic they get. Isn't that interesting? Until when Elihu comes on, he's a teenager and he knows all the answers. <laughs> it, it, it is so true to life. The man who wrote this book really understood human nature. That's why it has lasted so long, because it still speaks clearly. Well, Zophar was middle-aged but dogmatic, even insolent. He's what I call Joe Blunt. And he accuses Job of filibustering. That's a word they use in Parliament for talking long enough to put off a choice and a decision. <laughs> and he says, Job, you're just talking to cover up. Stop talking and do the right thing. As if the whole discussion is just babble. And he says, I wish God would tell you off. You... And he says, you may not be consciously a sinner, but you must be sinning unconsciously without realizing it. It's quite obvious. And he's quite insulting to Job. And he says, Job, you've got to choose between the broad way and the narrow way. You're either going to walk the wicked way or the righteous way. Got to be one or the other. He admits he's been puzzled by the prosperity of the wicked, but he says, I'm sure it doesn't last. But again, he's trying to force life into his ideas. So Job must be very wicked since his prosperity is gone. And he takes refuge in what we call God's omniscience. And he says, God knows everything, so he knows the sins you are not conscious of. So each of these men takes refuge in a doctrine about God. You follow that? And that's where many arguments go today. And people take refuge, well, God must be like this, so that's the answer. It's not always the answer. Well, he says, God even knows things about you that you don't know about yourself. Mind you, Zopha seems to claim to know everything as well. It's interesting how <laughs> they each take refuge in an aspect of God that they think they share. Well, they all have shared the same basic belief, and they are all trying to force the facts to fit their faith. That's a dangerous thing to do. And that's why they take refuge in doctrine. They say, well, it must be true because this is what the doctrine is. And they are forcing facts to fit their faith. And that's what we call bigotry. When you force persons to fit doctrine. Now, we need to have clear doctrine and hold it firmly. But we need to be careful how we apply it to individual cases. Do you follow me? Sometimes it may be true, but not always. As I've said already, it is sometimes true to say you are not healed because you don't have faith. It is sometimes true, but you need the wisdom to know when that's true and when it's not true. If you turn that into a doctrine that everybody who has faith has perfect health, and that's a common doctrine today and it's preached all over the world, that's become bigotry and it becomes hurtful where it is not true and you force the person to fit the faith, the facts to fit the faith, but we ought to face facts. Now there are hints of the ultimate answer that God will bring already. When we look at Job, altogether he makes ten speeches, three to Eliphaz, three to Bildad, three to Zophar and one to Elihu. And when you put all his speeches together and study them, God is responsible, he says, for my suffering. I, he says, I can't repent because I'm not conscious of any sin. And he racks his brain and he utterly refuses to say what is not true. He said, you're trying to force me to say I'm a sinner and I, I'm not. I have honestly sought to live right in God's sight. I'm not conscious of anything at the moment in which I'm doing wrong in God's sight. And that was true. Now there is a progression in his ten speeches. He also gets bolder in what he says to his friends, but above all he gets bolder in what he says to God. He becomes very bold to God. But there's an alternation of his moods between despair and hopelessness 
and then confidence and hope. And his mood swings are characteristic of people who are ill. You know those mood swings? When you hope things are going to turn out better and then you fear they're going to turn out worse. These mood swings are very clear. But he has a lovely way of talking to God. Why can't you leave me alone? You've got so many other people to bother about. Why are you so bothering me? And he, in fact, talks just like Tevier in Fiddler on the Roof. If you've seen that lovely film, uh, the way Tevier talks the Almighty. This would be a good time to send the Messiah. <laughs> oh, well, we'll wait for him some other place. <laughs> and off he goes. This kind of intimate talk, this frank, honest talk with God, is typical of Job. And Job argues with God, not just with the three friends. He shakes his fist at God. He says, God, I wish I could take you to a law court and put you in the defense box. Make you the defendant and I'll be the counsel of the prosecution. Let's have a court case, Lord. Let's see who wins that court case. And it's very bold. It's not cursing God, but he's challenging God. He gives him the choice of being the plaintiff or the defendant in a court case. Let's have this out, Lord. Let's settle it, Lord. Oh, if only I could get you to talk to me. I mean, we could, we could argue the case. You could tell me if I'm a sinner, but I don't think I am. I'm not conscious of it. But why don't you come and tell me if I am? And there's this frustration that God is silent while the friends are saying so much. And then now and again, now and again, in his good moods, he comes to the point where he believes that it will be settled even after his death. And that's, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And even if I die and worms eat my flesh, yet, and here's the proper translation, yet without my flesh I shall see God. And then I can put my case. So every now and again he believes that if he can't get God into the courtroom before he dies, that there'll be a court case afterwards. And that then it can be settled and he can be vindicated. But he's not quite sure about that. And so in his bad moods he says, If a man die, shall he live again? You see the mood swings? At times he's sure that after death he can meet God and settle it. And then he's not so sure. If a man dies, shall he live again? It is these alternating moods of hope and despair that are so human and so real when you're really going through it. Your emotions are up and down like this. You don't quite know where you are. Oh, it's a lovely book is this. There are two outstanding chapters in Job's speeches. In one, he makes a speech about wisdom. Chapter 28. We're going to sing a song shortly that Charles Wesley wrote from that whole chapter. Happy the man who finds the grace, the wisdom of God's chosen race. Happy. And it's a song about, oh, wisdom. Where can you get wisdom? He says, I'd go anywhere like people search for gold and silver. I search for wisdom. I want wisdom more than anything else. I'd rather be wise than clever. I want to be wise, not rich. It's a wonderful chapter, chapter 28. It's a song about wisdom. Uh, describing wisdom as a woman to be desired, which is exactly how Solomon describes wisdom in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is about a bad woman called foolishness and a good woman called wisdom. And the advice to a young man, seek wisdom as your companion, your partner. And the other chapter is chapter 31. Boy, that's a chapter which every man should read. It's a protest about his innocence. He said, if I've ever broken any laws of yours, Lord. And when you read it through, you'd almost think that Job had heard the Sermon on the Mount. It tells you how much understanding he has. If I've looked at a woman and lusted after her, Lord, then punish me for it. If I've done this, if I've done that. He almost goes through the Sermon on the Mount bit by bit. And he says, if I've done any of these, then Lord, I deserve my punishment. But he said, I haven't. I haven't. And that was true. He was a good man. And he could have read the Sermon on the Mount and said, I have kept all that. 
Well, after Job has made all his speeches, sorry, I said uh, the one of Elihu, he didn't speak to Elihu, he said three speeches to each of these three, and of course the opening speech that sparked the debate off, that was the ten speeches of Job. After they've all finished, the life as Bill Dadden's over, says, it's no use, and they walk off. And there's a teenager standing there. And of course, he knows everything. He's young. And he's got all the latest ideas. And he's apparently been standing there listening to the whole thing. And he suddenly appears and speaks. And Job never bothers even to answer him, and he disappears. Thank God. He's got a very different style. He's very young. He claims to be hesitant. Actually, he's the opposite. He starts by saying, of course, I'm very young and very inexperienced, but I know what's the matter with you. <laughs> it, it is so, so typical again. Impatient with the older man's words, he said, God needs someone who understands him, and I do. So I've got the answer to you. And he goes through the other arguments and refutes them. Actually, he's got nothing new to say. Nothing new. And he finishes up by accusing Job of his sin. He said, God uses different ways of saving people from themselves. Sometimes he uses visions and dreams in the night. But sometimes he uses sickness. And he said, I think that's what he's doing with you. He's helping you to mend your ways in the brink of time before you die. <laughs> what a wonderful way to comfort somebody. Well, Job has nothing to say to him. And so finally, Elihu goes too. Now then, the thing is that in fact, the three fan friends were not altogether wrong, as we're going to find out. They were wrong in applying this simple piece of wisdom, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. They, they are wrong in applying it rigidly to every situation. But their appeal, you remember, life has appealed to God's transcendence, that he's bigger than we are, that he's far away. Bildad appealed to his power. Zophar appealed to God's knowledge of everything. They were half right, as Job will now find out. But now, Job is arguing with God himself. And we come to the final round, as it were. Round one, God talks to Job as the creator. And he reminds Job who he's talking to. And I love this bit. I enjoy reading it. <laughs> Maybe there's a bit of sadism in me, but I just love it. Then the Lord answered Job. Now Job had asked God 36 times to talk. So God talks, and very quickly Job wishes he didn't. The humor here is, is beautiful. The Lord spoke out of the storm, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you? when I laid the world's foundation. <laughs> Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? And poor Job is beaten down to this size. I mean, if you're really going to ask God to talk to you, it's God who'll talk to you. And he's your creator. And he's the one who made the whole universe. Who are you to demand that I should answer your questions? You answer mine. And of course, Job can't answer them at all. And the questions that God just, more than 36 questions God asks, they team out. Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominions over the earth? Can you do this? Can you do that? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? 
question after question after question to remind Job that he's not God. And that's just too much for Job. And Job says, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. What's God's reaction to that? Brace yourself like a man, I will question you. <laughs> Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? And that God put his finger right on the spot. Because Job had a weakness here, which we all have. We'd rather be in the right and prove God to be in the wrong. What incredible impudence. And people say, why did God allow this? Why did God do that? They're saying, if I were God, I'd make a better job than he does. I could run the universe better than he does. Why should he do this? And why should They're trying to say, I'm in the right and he's in the wrong. How dare we say that to God? That is just sheer cheek. And so now, in the second round, God doesn't talk about himself as creator. He talks about two of his creatures. And this proves that God has a sense of humor. He says, Job, have you ever thought about the hippopotamus? Or the crocodile? Why do you think I made them? You know, it, it is almost laughable, isn't it? I mean, that the answer to this great question about life is the hippopotamus. You know? Have you ever thought about the hippopotamus? I mean, it's one of the funniest creatures there is. And the crocodile, why on earth did God create the crocodile? I don't understand that. I mean, its brain is the size of your thumbnail. It's one of the reasons you can't train a crocodile. It operates purely on instinct. Why on earth did God create that? And why does God talk so much about the hippopotamus and the crocodile? He's saying, Job, you just don't understand me. Because I made the hippopotamus. You don't know why I did that, do you, Job? <laughs> it, it is just so humorous. And Job is already battered into the ground, but this just finishes him off. Can you understand why I made such creatures? You don't even understand the animal world, never mind the moral world, Job. Job, why are you trying to argue with me? And Job finishes up. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours will be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I didn't understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. But what's really happened? He's back in touch with God again. That's what's really happened. That was his real problem, that God was far away and not talking to him. And now he's back in touch, and now he wishes he hadn't argued at all. And he said, I'm back with you, Lord. That's the main thing. And I repent. I'm sorry I even questioned you. You know what you're doing. Everything you do is right. I should have trusted you. That's when God said, right, Job, I give you back children, I give you back property, I give you back flocks of camels and sheep. And Job became far wealthier than he ever was, far happier than he ever was, and lived happily ever after. But God deeply criticizes his two friends, his three friends. And God actually said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And that tells you you mustn't quote these three speeches even though they're in God's word. 
Well, that's the final round between God and Job. And I notice that God hasn't given him any answers to his questions. And he hasn't told Job about his wager with Satan, because that would have spoiled it all. It wasn't good for Job to know what had gone on in heaven, because that could have disturbed his motivation. The main thing is Job wanted to get back to God, <laughs> and he was back in communion with God. And that was all he really needed. God had had a very good reason for allowing it to happen. But the whole test would have been invalid if Job had known. The test was to whether Job would trust God without knowing. Who do you think you are, Job? I'm the creator, you're a creature. Do you think I don't know what I'm doing? Do you think I don't know how to run the universe? Is that what you really think? You see, human pride expresses itself in a demand to know the reason for everything. And when you ask God, explain to me why you're allowing this, you're really saying, satisfy my reason that you have a good reason. We're really calling God to our judgment. Do you see what I mean? We're not trusting him. We're saying, God, if you can give me a good reason for this happening, I'll accept it. But you are answerable to me, and I have a right to know why you've allowed this. But that's to put yourself above the Creator. Do you see what I'm getting at? And what God was waiting for was a Job who said, God, I trust you. The relationship is not affected by what's happened. I trust you. I believe you know what you're doing, and I don't need to know the reason. Well. Of course, the whole book of Job to Christians takes on a different atmosphere because we see it through the cross of Jesus. And there's a sense in which the cross of Jesus puts a different value on human suffering. Because Job in that sense is what we call a type of Christ, of innocent suffering. He was a righteous man, yet he suffered as if he was a guilty man. And through the cross we begin to see that God can use that kind of situation for good. God allowed Satan to accomplish his son's death on the cross. And his son even said on the cross, my God, why? Why have you left me all alone? But we know why. And Jesus had known why. And after his resurrection, he told the disciples why. But even when Jesus asked the question, God didn't answer him, didn't say why. And it means that under the pressure of crucifixion, under the pressure of the pain, even the Son of God lost touch with the reason for what he was doing. The pressure of it made him lose his understanding of why it was all happening. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he'd known it had to happen. He'd known why. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost and to give his life a ransom for many, a means of setting them free. But on the cross he lost that. That's the real humanity of Jesus, that he didn't understand what was happening and God didn't tell him. But we know that it was all true. In the Greek version of the book of Job, an extra verse has been added by a different hand much later, clearly, when the Hebrew was translated into Greek, somebody wrote this verse at the end in the Greek version we call the Septuagint because 70 scholars translated it, sometimes called the LXX after those 70 scholars in Alexandria who translated the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek. They added this verse, which in the Greek version of the Old Testament is there, and it is written that Job will rise again with those whom the Lord raises up. That will be the final vindication of Job. And of course we believe that Jesus is coming again to judge the quick and the dead and that one day there will be a courtroom scene in which Jesus is the judge 
and all the wicked and righteous who've ever lived will stand before his throne to receive according to what they've done in the body. So what Job hoped for is actually going to come true. And one day there will be a vindication of justice and it will be seen to be done, publicly seen to be done, and God's righteousness will be applied to the entire human race. And Job will be there. He will be raised up with all others. Well, I hope that's helped you to understand the book of Job. Go and read it now. Read it aloud. Get a little group together and read it as a drama and give the different people the different speeches and then you'll get the interplay of all these. But finally, the most important round of the debate was the round between God and Job. When Job came back to God and said, I don't need to know as long as we're talking again. Amen.